By an unforgiving code of ethics, they proved ferocious in combat. They beat back foreign invaders and fought each other for land, status, honor, and power. Their legacy of martial artistry and self-discipline persists even today. They were the samurai. It's a typical training day at the Takeda School of Mounted Archery in Kamakura, Japan. Students on this practice course are keeping alive a warrior tradition that dates back over 1,300 years. It is called Yabusame, and it is a ceremonial and sacred form of mounted archery. Established in the 7th century as a way to pray for peace and prosperity across the land, Yabusame is still performed primarily at religious festivals and for visiting dignitaries. During each Yabusame event, archers, clothed in the hunting attire of medieval warriors, race their horses, one at a time, down the length of a narrow 200-yard course. Along the way, they shoot at a series of three targets spaced at 70-yard intervals. Arrows that hit the mark are considered good luck charms. Shiro Iataka Kaneko is the 35th master of the Takeda school. It takes about three years to be able to perform Yabusame for the first time. But the most talented ones have been practicing for 10 to 15 years. The key to successful Yabusame technique is the unique shape of the saddle stirrups that brace a rider's feet. They're really more like platforms than stirrups, but nothing less would do. A rider keeps all of his weight on his feet, not on the saddle. This way, his legs absorb the up and down movement of the horse, and it keeps his aim stable. Today, horseback archery is a highly specialized military art practiced by a select few. But it was once a common skill and the preferred method of fighting for an elite class of Japanese warrior known as samurai. The precise origins of the samurai are shrouded in mystery and speculation, and much of what we know of them has been handed down not as fact, but as legend and lore. What is certain, however, is that roughly 1,000 years ago, they emerged in a form much like the knights of medieval England. They were warriors who served regional lords and earned land and favor through valor in combat. Indeed, most of their battles involved the conquest of coveted land, one lord using his army of samurai to attack and seize the domain of another. Initially, samurai warriors fought as armor-clad mounted archers. Over time, their fighting methods evolved to include combat on foot using swords of supreme quality long wooden pole weapons called pikes and naginatas, and even matchlock muskets. Their attitudes were entwined with Buddhism and Japan's native Shinto religion. Eventually, they would also adopt a stringent code of behavior that would stress devout loyalty, stern self-discipline, and the zealous defense of personal honor. The code would also demand a particularly gruesome form of ritual suicide as a means to preserve one's honor in the face of defeat. The samurai class would come to dominate Japan, and over the course of their 700-year history, their values would shape the political and social framework of the country, leaving an indelible impact on the Japanese national identity. Japan is roughly the size of the state of California, its total land mass consists of four main islands surrounded by hundreds of smaller ones. Its first inhabitants are thought to have migrated from China 
and other parts of the Asian mainland between 30,000 and 12,000 BC. By 300 AD, some inhabitants had developed rice farming and established long-term settlements in the Yamato Plain, a fertile area in the southwestern portion of Honshu, Japan's main island. This permanent settlement soon gave birth to a political state based on military might and taxation paid in the form of rice. Rice is a labor-intensive way of getting food out of the ground. And it's also a way of getting food out of the ground that makes you very committed to a place. If you're doing slash and burn agriculture, you can up and move. If you're building an elaborate irrigation system and then growing rice on it, you've put years of labor into a spot and you need to farm it for years to get the value of your labor back. And this makes it very easy to tax people. They're less inclined to up and run away. Groups of extended families called clans began to struggle for dominance of the Yamato Plain. Small armies soon formed, supported largely by taxes collected from farmers. The history of this period is vague, but eventually one group, who took its name from the area in which it lived, made the right combination of strategic alliances to come out on top, the Yamato clan. They rose to dominance sometime in the 6th century. The Yamatos declared their successive leaders emperors and supported this move by also claiming divine origin. Their empire gradually widened as they conquered territories in neighboring regions of Honshu. Perhaps the most well-known figure from this family was a bigger-than-life warrior named Yamato Takero no Mikoto, better known as Prince Yamato. He was basically a mythical figure, a sort of Hercules sort of character that, that's invented as part of this growing political mythology. He's noted for a number of exploits. In the story, he sort of single-handedly travels about Japan, subduing various rebellious tribes and individual leaders. Prince Yamato's fearless and daring behavior, mythical or not, became an archetype for future Japanese warriors. In the middle of the 7th century, these so-called emperors uh, had accumulated enough uh, power enough control over at least the central parts of the main Japanese island in order to impose a political reform. In this reform, the imperial family set up a central government with a palace and a court of nobles, councillors and government administrators at the site of present-day Kyoto. To provide the nobles with income, imperial lands were divided and distributed among them. Income came from taxes, usually in the form of rice, paid by peasant farmers who worked the lands. But it was the responsibility of the nobles themselves to protect their lands and collect taxes. This could be especially difficult if a nobleman's property lay hundreds of miles from Kyoto. You have to form kind of a private army to make sure that the peasants are properly taxed and that you receive your income. Otherwise, there may be robbers on the way, you know, there are famines and there are robbers on the way that attack these convoys and they steal all the rice. Uh, that is your income. Manpower for these private armies was often drawn from warrior families living on the edges of the empire. Most were of noble descent. As the noble families in Kyoto had grown in size, many of the younger sons had been forced to the empire's boundaries to conquer new lands for themselves. These men fought from horseback, using the bow and arrow as their primary weapon, and frontier life had made them tough as nails. They became a sort of rural police force for the nobles in Kyoto, and were ultimately dubbed samurai, meaning one who serves. In exchange for their services, they demanded parcels of land. This was the true beginning of the samurai tradition. As more they were in demand, these warriors, the more powerful they became. Why? Because they also had to be paid in land. There was no money, right? And so sometimes the official in Kyoto had to divide his land, from which he drew his income, into half. One half would be his income, the other half would go for payment of the, the warriors who secure your whole area militarily. By the 10th and 11th centuries, the heads of some samurai families controlled huge tracts of land, 
and had become powerful warlords in command of vast armies of warriors. They battled each other for dominance, and it was only a matter of time before one of these strong leaders would attempt to brush the imperial family aside and seize the throne for himself. For coming generations, this grab for power would shape the samurai. History matters. Miura Hiromichi restores historical samurai armor. Just like the knights of medieval Europe, samurai wore suits of protective plating to deflect arrows and sword slashes. Miura is one of a handful of highly skilled artisans sought out by museum curators to restore early suits of armor that are now considered national treasures. Wealthy patrons also commissioned him to replicate famous pieces for their personal collections. This is how armor from the medieval period was worn. This is the fully armed samurai of that period. The helmet, the sleeve shields, the lower armor, sword, bow, and arrow quiver. And here is an attendant wearing an abbreviated version of the armor called Haraate. Except for the helmet, samurai armor usually wasn't made of metal like its European equivalent. Instead, it was made of dense sections of leather, layered for added strength and covered in lacquer to protect them from the humid Japanese climate. The leather sections, called kozane, were woven together with colored silk. Constructing one suit of armor took a large amount of silk, about 250 yards, and it took about 3,000 pieces of leather. That's a lot of materials. Because samurai armor was made of leather, it was relatively lightweight and flexible, ideal for use on horseback and in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. It wasn't just for fighting on the battlefield. There was a Japanese sense of beauty in it. It was made beautifully. It's been said by many that the armor was a costume to die in. But actually, Japanese armor was a costume to be worn in the celebration parade after victory in war. That's my belief. By the late 12th century, such wartime victories had come most often to a legendary clan of samurai warriors named Minamoto. For years, the Minamoto had served as a sort of enforcement arm of the imperial court. As other samurai clans in remote regions had amassed significant power, their leaders oftentimes had grown resentful of government authority. Some clans had actually risen in rebellion, and one samurai leader had even attempted to establish a parallel empire of his own. In many of these cases, the imperial court had sent the strong and loyal Minamoto family to bring the rebels into line. Over the years, this potent family produced some renowned samurai figures. One of the most famous was Minamoto Tamatomo. Tamatomo is considered possibly the greatest archer in samurai history. He's supposed to have been a giant, uh, well over six feet tall. His uh, left arm is supposed to have been uh, six inches longer than his right arm, which means that he's got an unusually long bow draw. Indeed, legend has it that he once sank an enemy boat with a single shot. In 1156, the reigning Japanese emperor died, and a deadly rift developed within the imperial family regarding which male heir would ascend to the throne. Warriors from leading samurai families fought for both factions. When the dust settled, Minamoto Tamitomo found himself on the losing side. The victors exiled him to a remote island and later sent forces by boat to kill him. In a token act of defiance, Tamitomo fired a few arrows from shore at the boats of his approaching attackers. The last arrow struck one of the boats near the waterline, penetrated the wooden hull, and sank the vessel. Still, with many more boats closing in, Tamitomo knew his fate was sealed. Determined not to die at the hands of his enemies, he left the shore and took his own life, and he did it in a particularly gruesome manner. <laughs> 
Tomotomo committed harakiri, which literally means belly cutting. He plunged a blade into one side of his abdomen, sliced across, and then made a second cut from top to bottom, virtually ensuring a slow, agonizing death. The act was so incredibly painful and took such courage to perform, it was a way for him to prove that he was taking his own life to save his honor, not simply out of cowardice. Otama Tomo was not the first warrior to take his own life in this way. His name is the first associated with the extreme act. In later centuries, harakiri, also known as seppuku, would become commonplace among defeated samurai and would evolve into a complex ritual governed by many rules. It would even include a second participant armed with a sword. This so-called second would automatically behead the dying man to shorten his suffering. There are some people who believe there are only three proper ways to cut. One would be one horizontal line, at which case the second would probably behead him. The second would be two crossing lines. Again, everything would be in the lower abdomen. The third would be three horizontal lines, the third being the most difficult, if you imagine cutting across and pulling up, cutting across again and pulling up, cutting across back this way. And that might be enough for a man just to die, just to expire there. A lot of theories as to why this particular form of suicide becomes popular. Japanese language and Japanese culture has a lot of expressions dealing with the belly as the kind of center of emotions and, and such, the same way that English speaks of somebody with a big heart or a black heart. Japanese will speak of someone with a big belly or a black belly. And so there may be something to the idea of ripping your belly open and saying, see, it's not black. In the years following Tametomo's death, his nephew, Yoritomo, led the Minamoto clan to a position of supreme military power in Japan. In 1192, the emperor dubbed Yoritomo Shogun, an ancient title given to generals before the time of the samurai who were sent out to subdue barbarians at the edges of the empire. The title had always been a temporary one, but Yoritomo would make it permanent. As Japan's ultimate military leader, Yoritomo exercised more practical and administrative power than the imperial court itself. Eventually, the state of affairs in Japan became similar to the one found in England today, in which the royal sovereign is merely a figurehead and the parliamentary prime minister actually runs things. To escape court politics in Kyoto, Yoritomo set up a parallel government run by samurai in Kamakura, just south of modern-day Tokyo. But this shogun-led government, or shogunate, never pushed the emperor aside completely. There was really no alternative. The emperors were not really seen as having political authority. The emperors were more seen as, as the high priest of the country. You could compare the emperors to, to a certain extent with the popes of Europe. I mean, you can go and kill a king, but to kill a pope is a problem <laughs> because he is the source of authority, of religious authority, and the, the, the political leadership needed that religious authority with, without which they couldn't rule. Despite Minamoto Yoritomo's grand successes, Peace in Japan would not last. As an old samurai adage wisely cautioned, after victory, tighten your helmet cords. Feuding among clans would continue, and another threat, one that was not homegrown, loomed on the horizon. In the year 1274, the people of Japan faced a grave threat from mainland Asia. The ferocious Mongol regime that had conquered Korea and China over the last century was, again, looking to expand its empire. Its leader, the legendary Kublai Khan, wrote to the Japanese emperor informing him that the Mongols expected to receive tributes and taxes from Japan. Khan received no response. Enraged, the Mongol ruler dispatched a fleet of warships to teach the obstinate provincials a lesson. It's the only time between the early 500s and the 20th century 
that Japan was invaded by a foreign power and one of only two times that Japan, the Japanese warriors actually fought a foreign enemy. The Mongol fleet set out from the Korean peninsula with hundreds of ships and several thousand men. They landed at Hakata Bay on Japan's southernmost main island. The samurai warriors sent to face them were in for a rude awakening. They confronted a very different form of battle. The samurai method of fighting during this period was somewhat ritualized and consisted primarily of mounted archery duels. Proud opponents on horseback would square off in bouts of individual combat. The Mongols, having arrived by ship, had no horses and fought on foot, many with swords and spears. They simply formed themselves into tight, powerful units and attacked. And in this battle, many of them ruthlessly speared the samurai horses. For added shock effect, they even made use of explosive devices filled with gunpowder. So the sound made the samurai horses panic. And so samurai had to withdraw to the uh, capital in Kyushu. At the end of the day, the Mongols held the battlefield, but apparently they didn't know they had won. Perhaps believing the samurai would be reinforced and attacked that night, the Mongols suddenly pulled back to their ships and set sail. For now, at least, the samurai were safe. However, they feared it could happen again, so they immediately took preventative measures. The Kamakura government uh, basically constructed walls along every beach where sizable forces could land. And these walls that could extend for miles, they'd be about sometimes several feet high, several feet wide, and they'd be about 20 feet behind the beaches. A good thing, because the Mongols came back. Seven years later, Kublai Khan put together an armada of several thousand ships and tens of thousands of men. The wall building paid off. This second Mongol fleet was forced to remain afloat for weeks, depleting food and water supplies, while they looked for a suitable place to land. Meanwhile, the Japanese readied themselves for a horrendous battle. They prepared to fight, and they prayed. Coincidentally, the prayer must have worked, because nature soon intervened. A storm of the century swept in and obliterated hundreds of Mongol ships. There was a typhoon. It did hit, and it did destroy one whole fleet. I just say it was, the typhoon was the end point of a defeat long in the making. That's how I look at it. It didn't cause the defeat, it just finalized the defeat. This typhoon is the reason we have the phrase kamikaze today. The samurai who defended against the Mongols had prayed for assistance from their Shinto deities. Shinto is roughly a mixture of ancestor and nature worship. The warriors believed that the gods delivered the storm, so they called it kamikaze, which means divine wind. To keep the gods on their side, since they fully expected the Mongols to try again, both the imperial court and the shogunal government in Kamakura ordered an ongoing series of prayer rituals at Shinto shrines and Buddhist temples across the land. To help in the effort, they also tried to harness another perceived form of spiritual power. For the samurai, the importance of the sword cannot be overstated. Swords had long been thought to possess unique spiritual qualities. Accordingly, master swordsmiths were commissioned to make special blades for shrines and temples as tokens of good luck. The process of making a sword, it's not simply pounding out the metal. It was actually a religious experience as well. Often we hear about smiths who, who meditate, who pray, who recite sutras while they're making the sword. I have one particular sword. He meditated for 100 days underneath a waterfall in the freezing winter before making a sword. So the idea was to purify not only his technique, but his mind, body, and soul. And that was all put into the process of making each blade. This is, this is a great tradition, really fascinating. Japanese swords before the seventh century were straight-bladed, double-edged weapons. The straightness of the blade made them better suited for thrusting than slashing. When the sword hits something, there is an impact. With the straight-edged sword, that impact comes straight to the hand. But the design of the arched sword makes the impact less. 
Another benefit of a curved sword is that it is easier to draw from its scabbard when worn at the waist. To take advantage of these benefits, over time, swords made in Japan gradually took on more and more blade curvature. The sword took its final shape in the mid to late 7th century. This is the curved single edge blade. From this time, maybe we can count over 40,000 smiths throughout the history of Japanese sword making up to the present day. Perhaps the most renowned swordsmith of all time was a man named Masamune. He lived and worked some 750 years ago, right at the time of the end of the second Mongol invasion. He, in fact, was one of the smiths asked to make good luck swords to help prevent the Mongols from returning. It must have worked, because the Mongols never threatened Japan again. Incredibly, Masamune's legacy continues today. Modern swordsmith Yamamura Tsunahiro is the 24th generational descendant in the Masamune line. In a rustic shop in Kamakura, Japan, he and several apprentices still forge masterworks of martial steel in the traditional manner. Working together, the students wield the massive hammers that actually shape the hot steel, while the master taps out instructions to guide them. Where I am sitting, in musical terms, is the conductor's chair. And with the hammer in my hand and gestures, I signal where to pound and how fast or slow. Throughout the process, Yamamura occasionally rolls the steel mass in a mound of charred straw ash to add carbon. The amount of carbon a sword blade contains determines its flexibility. By folding and refolding the metal over and over again, we strengthen it. That's the purpose of the process. Boric acid inserted in each fold removes oxygen and prevents rusting between layers. It takes about two weeks to complete the process, a long wait for an eager client. The most frequent clients are collectors, also ones who have a specific purpose, or ones that experience something for the first time, something worthy of commemorating, for which they want a sword for protection. That is common as well. For instance, a protection sword for the newly born grandchild or the newly rebuilt home. Those kinds of requests are common. Asked what it means to him when he holds one of his completed and autographed blades in his hands, Yamamura admits to his immense gratification. It is the proof that I'm alive. When I put my name into a sword, it's going to remain there for about a thousand years. And that's proof I lived in this age. Indeed, swords crafted by his famous ancestor of 700 years past are still in private collections today. Each one having been passed down through the centuries following the Mongol invasions. As the years progressed, this simple yet elegant form of sidearm would become such a valued instrument of personal protection and such an integral component of the warrior identity, it would come to be known as the soul of the samurai. The attempted Mongol invasions of Japan in the 13th century had a late developing but far-reaching impact on the political stability of the island nation. 
These events ultimately helped bring about a period of strife that came to be known as the age of the country at war, Japan's great civil war. In this tumultuous era, individual samurai took on greater importance than ever before. Samurai didn't fight for free. They expected rewards for their efforts. After all, weapons, armor, horses, and servants were expensive. Every act required compensation. And if there was an obligation, it was for lords to adequately compensate their followers. A lord that was too stingy could not garner enough support, and the warriors would leave him. Rewards usually came in the form of parcels of captured enemy territory. But there were no newly conquered lands to be had at the end of the Mongol invasions. Indeed, there was no plunder at all. Many powerful warlords had gone to great expense to defend the country, and neither the shogun nor the imperial court offered any compensation. Resentment grew, and eventually many warlords decided that since there wasn't much reward in serving the organized government, they would do as they pleased. By the late 1400s, power had shifted into the hands of a group of major regional landowners and warlords called daimyo. When you literally translate that term, it means great name. It just means great person. And it emerges in the 1400s and really the 1500s as a title warlords give themselves. Prior to this, these influential men were happy using titles given to them by the imperial court or by the shoguns. But those days were past. You're a daimyo pretty much because you call yourself a daimyo. So it really marks the decentralization of authority that happens in the 1400s and 1500s. People aren't looking to central authority anymore to say, you get to command men. You get to command men, and you get a title because thousands of men follow you. That's good enough. The daimyo essentially became independent rulers of small autonomous states, each one trying to swallow up his neighbors. Japan entered a state of almost constant civil war that would last for nearly 100 years and affect virtually every citizen. At the top of the social hierarchy, brother battled brother. Sons tried to depose their fathers. Nephews assassinated their uncles. Nothing seemed to matter if it got in the way of political ascendancy. Even lower-ranking samurai often change sides from fight to fight. If you change sides opportunistically, then you're a traitor. But if you're faced with the threat of death and you don't flinch, and you show that I'm willing to die to defend my lord, I'm willing to die fighting even after my lord is dead, you have this opportunity to say, okay, change sides, it's okay. I knew you were willing to die, but I'm not gonna ask that of you. Everyone from farmers to merchants became militarized and could be called to battle for their regional lord at a moment's notice. Even women got into the act. In at least a few instances, women actually donned armor, mounted horses, and charged into the fray. And if you think about it, warfare dominated by mounted archers uh, is not disadvantageous to women at all because they're light, they're agile, um, as long as they have the strength to shoot the bow and arrow, they, they can perform just as well as men. As the number of available combatants increased, a tactical revolution of sorts began to occur. Warlords began to rely less on mounted warriors and more on foot soldiers. The units were made up of peasant troops using yaris, long wooden spears with metal heads, much like English pikes. These troops moved on foot and were commanded by disciplined mounted samurai. One thing that's really remarkable about the warriors of Japan is that they were highly literate and they would write down their accounts in battle. And particularly they write down all their wounds um, and damages suffered uh, in great detail. And I'll give you one example. Um, one warrior actually wrote that um, one of his, his samurai uh, had been shot in the face, an arrow had gone through his jaw and lodged in the chest. An administrator looked at this and then wrote shallow. I assume it meant the chest, but anyway, you know, they were very strict, as you could tell. Fighting during this period was certainly brutal, 
but there were rewards to be had for courageous service. Proving one's service in combat, however, often involved a particularly gruesome practice, enemy headhunting. When warriors fought in battle, they needed physical evidence of their valor. If they would kill someone, they would try to cut off the head. As soon as they had a head, they would just leave the battlefield because they could then present this as proof of their service and demand compensation for their actions. It wasn't long before some warriors got wise and began arriving late to the fight, taking a head from an enemy that was already dead and presenting it for reward. Such fraud led to another strange practice, formal head viewings. As time passed, there's the idea that you could only get credit for the head if it was someone that you had actually killed. And so they started looking very closely to see if this head had been cut off when the person was still alive or from a corpse. As the nature of warfare changed to involve many more troops, being successful became more about logistical skill than tactical prowess. It's being able to govern an area, extract revenue, extract men, incorporate them into large armies, supply them with pikes. Large-scale warfare also led to a surge in castle building. From 1550 to 1600, dozens were built. The typical design looked much like a castle of medieval Europe, with a central tower or keep at the center of a compound and surrounded by massive stone walls and a moat. Some castles, like the spectacular structure that still stands today at Himeji, just east of Osaka, Japan, incorporated architectural features that could present nasty surprises to unwitting attackers. You enter a castle thinking you're taking the most direct route to the castle keep where you'll get the enemy daimyo, and you wind up running into a blind alley, and then you find that these steep walls on either sides of you have hatchways or doors that open and people can shoot at you, they can drop boiling oil at you, and this, even strolling through with a tour guide, it's scary. Yet even in this age of big armies and massive fortresses, the traditional samurai spirit of the lone warrior fighting his enemy face to face was still not completely extinguished. Legend has it that two rival daimyo, Uesugi Kenshin and Takeda Shingen, once engaged in brief hand-to-hand -hand combat. Takeda and Uesugi were roughly the same age and were two of the best commanders and administrators of the period. They also happened to live on each other's borders, which made them career-long rivals. They fought a series of battles for, in fact, at exactly the same site, year after year after year, a, a small island called Kawanakajima. It sits right between their two domains. Most of those were more or less chess piece type battles where they draw up lines, kind of maneuver around each other, and, and then go home uh, with very little shooting down. However, one battle between the armies of these two daimyo was actually quite bloody. Supposedly, at some point during this battle, in all the confusion, Takeda Shingen, who was sitting behind lines directing troops, found himself cut off from his own bodyguard, and Uesugi Kenshin and his immediate guard had managed to, to penetrate the Takeda lines to get in close to, uh, to Shingen. So supposedly, Kenshin came riding at uh, Shingen, sword drawn, and tried to slash at him, and uh, Shingen, who was sitting in a chair at the time, then blocked the sword strike with his war fan, his uh, baton, essentially. By the time Kenshin could wheel his horse around for another strike, Shingen's bodyguard was rejoining him, and he decided that, that he had to leave. While this story suggests an enduring hatred between these two warlords, another tale suggests that years of rivalry may have evolved into a mild fondness between the two. No medieval army could function without one of the most basic natural resources, salt. Armies needed it for myriad purposes, the most important being the curing and preservation of food. Warlord Takeda Shingen's home province of Kai was landlocked. It had no direct access to the sea. So Takeda was forced to import salt from other provinces. This became an Achilles heel during an incident in which Takeda's province was besieged by two enemy forces at once. They managed to essentially put a blockade around Kai and, and embargo salt, which of course was rapidly creating intense suffering in Kai uh, with the idea of essentially starving the Takeda war machine to its knees. Mm -hmm. 
Well, just as things were getting darkest, so goes the story. Over the hill and across the pass comes a uh, mule train or a horse train of, of, of pack horses sent by Uesugi Kenshi carrying salt and essentially running the blockade. Afterwards, other counselors and such asked Kenshin, well, why would you do that? Why would you rescue Shingen? I mean, he was on his knees and he would have been out of your way. And, and he replied, battles are to be won with swords and spears, not with rice and salt. Inevitably, after decades of frequent battles during the age of the country at war, specialists in sword technique and other fighting skills emerged in due course and gained notoriety. These men would eventually be called upon to share their knowledge and their insights would prove enormously valuable to both samurai and other fighting men for centuries to come. In a graceful, aging training hall on the grounds of Japan's elite Tokyo University, a group of committed students spend their evenings practicing kendo, the way of the sword. Kendo is a modern form of competitive fencing, but this activity began as an important martial art, one born of traditional samurai schools of swordsmanship. Kobayashi Hideo heads the university's kendo program. There was a set of primary fighting skills practiced by every samurai. It was called buge juhapan, the standard 18 martial arts. And these included horseback riding, archery, and others. And kendo was one of them. It was a required subject. Kendo was really the most important one. In very early forms of the art, students practiced with solid hardwood swords. But over the years, to keep things safe, these heavy sticks were replaced by lightweight, flexible bamboo versions. Students today also wear wire face masks and padding to protect their bodies. After an extensive warm-up, the students square off in fencing matches. The outcome of each match is determined by a point system that gives credit for successful strikes. The shout or scream a combatant utters when he or she strikes is called kiai. It's used to help integrate the body and mind and create a strong spirit in the intended cut. Since it is such an intense game, Manners are very important. Kendo really values etiquette, so it starts with a bow and ends with a bow. The earliest forms of Kendo were actually born in the age of the country at war, a period of time stretching basically from 1470 to 1570. Since the daimyo had to win battles to stay in power, they sought out the top military specialists in the land to train their samurai. Until then, most military training was very informal and mainly family-based. Beginning in the 1400s, you start to find warriors reaching out beyond that, and you find warriors that develop reputations as particularly good fighters uh, or being particularly good with one or another weapon beginning to systematize what they're doing and, and to begin to, to think in, in more depth about, okay, why am I winning all of these fights and, and suggesting that maybe I could teach this to other people. And so began the mentoring of the samurai. The courses of instruction many of these experts put in place for the daimyo went on to become the basis of formal fighting styles or schools. The founder of one of these styles and one of the greatest swordsmen in Japanese history was Sukuhara Bokuden. Born into a samurai family in 1490, Bokuden became one of the most accomplished samurai of all time. He fought in more than 30 major battles and at least 19 instances of single man-to-man -man combat in which he killed his opponents. His skills brought him fame, but along with that came an annoying and dangerous byproduct frequent challenges from other samurai who wish to test their prowess against his. For years, Bokuden eagerly rose to these challenges, but as he grew older, his attitude about engaging in such needless combat changed drastically. Eventually, he adopted the outlook that it should be the ultimate goal of a martial artist to resolve conflicts without coming to blows, or at a minimum, without causing unnecessary bloodshed. <laughs> 
This, however, did not stop young challengers from trying to provoke him. Once on a boat trip across an inland lake, a young aggressive samurai began trying to goad Bokuden into a fight. The other samurai keeps pestering him and, and, and pestering him, and he finally decides that he's not going to get rid of him, so he says, okay, well, look, we, if we're going to do this, we don't have room on the boat, let's go over on shore. There's an island over there where we can be dropped off over there and we can fight there. Well, as they pull up on shore and the other samurai jumps out of the boat, then Bokuden cast off and pulls back out in, in the stream, leaving the guy shouting at him and saying, well, what are you doing here? And he says, well, well, my style of swordsmanship is, involves fighting without fighting. Bokuden lived to the ripe old age of 80, dying of natural causes in 1571. Traces of his renowned fighting style can still be seen in several forms of the Japanese martial arts today. Many of these forms teach either unarmed techniques or combat using wooden weapons, such as the bamboo sword in kendo. But there are a few remaining styles in which the true soul of the samurai, the actual steel-bladed sword, is still central. One of these forms is Iaido. Iaido is the art of reacting to a surprise attack by counterattacking with a sword. Samurai studied Iaido to train their minds and bodies to deliver swift, immediate, and direct responses to aggression. The art taught them to eliminate unnecessary physical movement from their sword technique and to calm their spirit in order to achieve a peaceful and harmonious, yet very active and ready, state of mind. In Iaido, uh, the movement is not simply to learn how to cut or destroy the human being, but it's more the emphasis on the correctness of the form and the correctness of the mental attitude, the proper focus, the proper blending of how your spirit and how your body and how the sword can move as a perfect integrated unit. In its solo form, Iaido involves a series of proscribed movements designed to defeat imaginary opponents. At the moment, the person has the sense to attack. The sword is drawn, the opponent is cut down, and the sword is returned to the scabbard in one motion, almost as if nothing happened. A two-man form also has preset routines of movement, but performing them with perfection takes years of disciplined effort. What you see is that the swords barely touch. This is the epitome of sword technique. You never touch the other person's sword, but you move in and cut him in his unprotected area. So the sword is always a cutting weapon. It's not a weapon to block or defense. Since few practitioners of Iaido today will ever have the actual need to cut down an opponent with a sword, the true appeal of studying the art is the attainment of self-discipline and the alert, calm, and confident state of mind it brings to dedicated students. For the 16th century samurai, however, martial arts training was less about obtaining a calm state of mind and more about learning to kill one's adversaries. The techniques developed by men like Tsukuhara Bokuden helped him do that very efficiently. As a result, there would be no lack of bloodshed in the closing centuries of samurai rule. Japanese historians sometimes refer to the age of the country at war as the time in which the low oppressed the high. Some of the leaders who emerged as most powerful during this chaotic time were not necessarily of noble lineage. Their military ability and sometimes less than honorable actions pulled them to the top of the social ladder. In the chaos of 1500s warfare, you have people rising from rather humble origins and you also have people rising from rather seemly origins, people who at key moments decided to leave their lord, to die in battle, go back, take control of the castle. Out of this turmoil, in 1568, a samurai chieftain of modest beginnings emerged. His name was Oda Nobunaga, and he would attempt to turn the country around. Nobunaga hailed from a small rural fiefdom, 
but his outstanding military skills soon gained him many allies and brought him to prominence. He was an ambitious man, so much so that he dreamed of ruling the entire country. Indeed, the motto on his seal was to bring the whole country under one sword, and he didn't plan to do it by relying solely on military might. He started with a more subtle means, arranged marriages. Nobunaga married himself and two of his immediate family to members of other powerful clans. These unions established a formidable power base. He then began the process of intimidating other warlords to join with him. Those who refused his overtures, he fought using every means at his disposal, including the latest tools of destruction, firearms. The first firearms were introduced to Japan in 1543, when a Chinese junk was blown off course and landed on a Japanese island. On board were three Portuguese travelers. Each of these Westerners carried a gun, a matchlock musket. When one of the Portuguese shot a duck, the daimyo in the region became fascinated with the weapons and purchased all three of them. He then ordered his chief metal worker to copy them. Guns soon spread throughout the land, Many samurai resisted their use, a decision they would later regret. The introduction of the matchlock musket transforms warfare in Japan. And the warriors who adopt it quickly decimate the warlords who don't adopt it, or don't adopt it as well. Oda Nobunaga welcomed the new weapons with open arms and mastered their use in battle. At the height of his power, he incorporated a force of at least 3,000 gunners into his vast armies. In a famous battle near Nagashino Castle in 1575, he formed at least 1,500 gunners into three ranks behind pickets. He ordered them to fire in volleys, one rank moving up to fire, while another rank reloaded. With this tactic, the gunners held off a force many times their size. If you use them correctly, you can destroy mounted cavalry. Mounted cavalry at this point being mostly archers. These are the battles that decide the balance of power in the late 1500s in Japan. But despite Oda Nobunaga's formidable political and military prowess, he would never live to see a united Japan. Like so many of history's most ambitious men, Nobunaga was assassinated before he had fully achieved his dream, cut down in 1582 by one of his own disgruntled generals. The exact motive behind the killing is unclear, but it is thought the angry general felt he had not been properly rewarded for his services. By the time of his death at age 48, Oda Nobunaga had united a full one-third of the Japanese daimyo, but it would be left to his successor, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, to complete the task. Hideyoshi was another forceful leader that had risen from humble origins and reached prominence due to his fighting ability. Here is someone who demonstrates the social mobility that comes with constant warfare. He rose from the status of sandal carrier. This is someone who ran alongside a lord and had his sandals ready when he got off his horse and he re rises to be the supreme warlord in Japan. Following Nobunaga's assassination, Toyotomi Hideyoshi immediately tracked down and killed the assassin. An act of loyalty, perhaps, but also a timely political move. Nobunaga had an heir, a young son, who should rightfully have succeeded his father, but Hideyoshi capitalized on the glory he won through his act of revenge and seized power for himself. But he can't be seen as a usurper because, good heavens, he didn't assassinate Oda Nobunaga. In fact, he tracked down his assassin and punished him. As the new most powerful daimyo in Japan, Hideyoshi took over where Nobunaga had left off. He continued the process of wrangling lesser warlords under his central control using a combination of subtle political maneuvering and ruthless military might. By 1590, all of Japan's daimyo had submitted to Hideyoshi's authority. Oda Nobunaga's dream of a united Japan was now a reality. <laughs> 
Then Hideyoshi did something quite surprising to protect his own position. The moment he attained complete power, he implemented a sort of gun control. He confiscated all swords from the peasantry and merchant class. Marvelous pretext for that is, of course, the swords will be melted down and they'll be used to create a huge image of the Buddha. So when you give up your swords, uh, you are not giving up power and you're not giving up a right to defend yourself or a means of defending yourself. You're simply helping Toyotomi Hideyoshi bring the country to peace through the healing powers of this great Buddha image. Hideyoshi didn't stop with confiscating weapons. He slams the door on social mobility. He issues edicts saying that if you are not a samurai now, you never will be. And it's probably because knowing how commoners could rise to power, he was acutely aware of what a threat that could be to his own legitimacy. He strictly separated samurai, farmers, and townspeople, and began what would become a formal system of four social classes, samurai, farmer, artisan, and merchant, in that order. This classification also put in place criteria that set samurai apart from the rest of society. People had to choose whether they would be a commoner or a samurai. A samurai meant they had the privilege of having two swords and they could serve a lord, but they would lose all ties to their lands. And one who wanted to be a commoner supposedly couldn't have any weapons but could hold land. That's where we really see the division happening. And from that point on, you see all samurais must have two swords as a symbol of their status. The two swords represented a badge of rank, much like the sidearm worn by a modern police officer. But there was also a practical purpose. A long sword could be cumbersome indoors and was typically removed by a samurai upon entering a building. The additional short sword at his side allowed him to remain armed at all times. For the lower ranks of society, lack of respect for a wearer of two swords could mean death. Samurai have, in theory, the right of kiristego men, which basically means if a commoner does something extremely inappropriate, you can take their head off and then just apologize and explain why this was so offensive. And that's part of how commoners live, with this strange sense that they can get away with a lot, but you never quite know when you're going to cross the line and lose your head. Even with all his power, one official honor would always elude Toyotomi Hideyoshi, the coveted title of Shogun. According to ancient tradition, the title could only be bestowed on a warlord by the emperor, and only after the designee had proved his descent from the ancient Minamoto clan, the legendary family who had established the first permanent shogunate. With Hideyoshi's humble origins, that was an impossibility. In consolation, the imperial family, which by this time had almost no political power, but in the eyes of the people still held divine authority, conferred on Hideyoshi the substitute title of regent. This would open a door in the future for a new leader among the samurai, a skilled general who was waiting in the wings and could lay claim to the title of shogun. This man would soon create a shogunal dynasty that would persevere for 250 years. In September 1598, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, the man who brought an end to more than 100 years of civil war in Japan, died in his sleep at age 62. He had hoped to pass on his ruling position to his five-year-old son, trusting that his top aides would shelter the boy until he came of age. It was not to be. Hideyoshi's right-hand man, Tokugawa Ieyasu, wanted the power for himself. He amassed an army of 74,000 followers and led it against a force of 80,000 Toyotomi loyalists. The two armies clashed at a strategic crossroads called Sekigahara on October 21st, 1600. 
At the start of the battle, the Toyotomi warriors were already in place. Tokugawa Ieyasu advanced his samurai against them under the cover of early morning fog. As opposing groups of warriors blundered into one another, skirmishing broke out along the lines. Initially, the element of surprise gave the Tokugawa forces an advantage. But as the fog lifted and fighting intensified, momentum shifted against them. It looked as though Tokugawa Ieyasu might go down in defeat. Then, just in the nick of time, he saved himself with an adept political move. What shows Ieyasu's brilliance at Sekigahara is not that he brings more men to the field, but that he subverts the unity of the opposite side. Ieyasu sent agents to coax the commander of a sizable portion of the enemy force to change sides. It worked, and the Toyotomi forces were overwhelmed. It was an epic battle in samurai history. Tokugawa Ieyasu was now the undisputed military leader of Japan. Unlike his predecessor, he had every intention of claiming the venerated title of Shogun. Tradition, of course, required that he be of Minamoto clan descent to qualify. He wasn't, but he devised a way to circumvent that annoying technicality. Tokugawa Ieyasu had to present to the emperors uh, a falsified genealogy in order to prove that he was a descendant of the Minamoto. And of course, this was known to the imperial family, but it was a kind of a pro forma thing. And so once a fairly convincing document was presented to them, they could close an eye on whether it was absolutely historically accurate. Ieyasu assumed the office of shogun with great fanfare in 1603. He set up his shogunate, his military government, in Edo, modern-day Tokyo, and peace soon settled over the land. It was a peace Ieyasu would enforce with an iron fist. A key to this enforcement amounted to a sort of formalized system of hostage-taking, a practice long in use by powerful daimyo to help maintain domestic tranquility. It wasn't uncommon for daimyo, in order to cement an alliance amongst each other, to exchange relatives. And you'd have some very odd ones, like sending your mother to stay with a new ally, just to show that even though we've met on the battlefield before, I'm not going to attack you. You send me a daughter, you send me a son, I'll send you a daughter, I'll send you my mother, and you'd exchange relatives, really to show that you were committed to not fighting each other, to remaining allies. Ieyasu's system required all daimyo to maintain a residence near the shogunal headquarters in Edo. He demanded that they live there much of the time. They're allowed to maintain a castle in their homeland, and they're allowed to maintain that home base. But every other year, they need to travel to Edo and live in a villa, which can be rather lavish, but can't be particularly well fortified. In fact, it's supposed to be a non-military residence in the shadow of Edo Castle, Tokugawa Ieyasu's castle, and they live there roughly half the time because they travel there, they live there for a period of maybe 10 months, and they travel back. But while a daimyo was away visiting his property, his family members had to remain in Edo. As an added measure of control, the new shogun's government closely monitored travel. These conditions made it virtually impossible for regional lords to clandestinely join together, muster armies, and rise in revolt. Eventually, the new shogun even all but sealed Japan's borders to keep out rebellious influences from abroad. Most Japanese could not travel to other countries, and only a few select foreigners could visit Japan or establish trading posts on the islands. He divided his enemies so brilliantly that by the time he dies, the Tokugawa regime is this solid dynasty that lasts over 250 years. This extended peace, however, ultimately had a profound impact on samurai culture and identity. For 600 years, the primary purpose of most samurai had been warfare. The majority of them did not farm or construct buildings or conduct business of any kind. 
they had earned their living by training for and engaging in combat. But with the long-lasting peace brought by the Tokugawa shogunate, samurai weren't quite sure what to do with themselves. They each still received a stipend for being a warrior, but warrior skills were no longer in demand. The samurai could literally do nothing. They could be idle from morning till night. They could read books, they could philosophize about the beauty of honor and nobility and uh, committing seppuku and all that. And they didn't have to have a real job. Grasping for a sense of purpose, many threw themselves into teaching and study. Martial arts schools blossomed and became even more formalized and ritualistic, especially schools that specialized in sword technique. If you're going to train in some sort of martial art, you might as well train primarily with the weapon that you're always carrying, as opposed to training in spearmanship or archery or whatever, because you're not ever going to use that. If you're ever going to get into a street fight with a weapon, for example, or whatever, you're probably going to defend yourself with your swords. But not all samurai concentrated on study and teaching. Some became public administrators and bureaucrats. Still others took up poetry and the arts or entered the monasteries. And it was all done with great intensity and an exaggerated sense of importance. It was as if they needed to convince themselves and everyone else that they still deserved their place at the head of society. Warrior behavior became stylized where the importance of martial arts, the importance of spiritual beliefs, all those uh, things that we associate with the samurai, I really see as being a creation of the 17th century. When we have peace in Japan, and we have to find out, well, we have these, these sword-bearing officials who get income, what is their purpose? There's no wars. And I think that there's this real sense that they try to, to create this sort of code of conduct. <laughs> In the late 17th and early 18th centuries, several samurai scholars composed written works that attempted to set forth rules and philosophies by which all samurai should live. These works had similar themes, stressing the concepts of the preservation of personal honor, mastering of the martial arts, and setting an example for the rest of society, and most importantly, duty to one's lord to the point of death. This set of ideals collectively became known as the warrior code. One work that explored this code, called Hagakure, Hidden Behind Leaves, stressed the importance of self-sacrifice, but it also contained elaborate instructions for the day-to-day -day conduct of a samurai. It goes through these incredible uh, descriptions of what the samurai must do with himself. You know, he must uh, uh, be incredibly sanitary and clean. He must uh, prepare his nails in a certain way. He must always carry rouge in his side bag because he may die. And when he dies, he doesn't want to look pale or frightened. So he must always be ready to present the front of someone who has eagerly chosen death. When the samurai goes out to battle, he must burn incense in his helmet so that when he is beheaded by his victor, he will present to the victor who rips the helmet off a pleasant, an aesthetic, a memorable experience. Such musings may have simply been a luxury of peace, a peace that at the time of the writing of Hagakure had already lasted over 80 years. In centuries past, when battle was frequent, warriors were often forced to take a more pragmatic approach to self-sacrifice. One of the documents I looked at in the 14th century, they said, we attacked the enemy but started suffering casualties, so we fled. No stigma, no dying, they're not gonna just, you know, die like that. Later on, there's this notion that you should die for your Lord. The attitudes toward that are very different. Peacetime luxury or not, most samurai during the Tokugawa shogunate period took the ideas espoused in the warrior code very seriously. In 1703, these principles were the root of one of the most famous displays of warrior loyalty and self-sacrifice in all of samurai history. Asano Naganori was the daimyo of Ako, a fiefdom 100 miles southwest of Osaka. Naganori had been assigned to ceremonial duty in the shogun's palace, a duty that required special training and etiquette. During the course of this training, the etiquette instructor, an established member of the shogun's staff, insulted Naganori. This infuriated the daimyo, and in a fit of rage, he pulled his short sword 
and slashed at the instructor's head. He didn't manage to kill him. He managed to wound him. But drawing a weapon and attacking another uh, samurai in, in, within the shogun's castle is a capital offense. And so he was immediately arrested uh, and sentenced to commit seppuku. Naganori carried out the punishment immediately, committing the ritual suicide. Following Naganori's death, the government confiscated his lands. The warriors who had served him instantly became ronin, the term used to describe a samurai without a master. The men no longer had a home or an income. In the medieval period, this was never really a problem because there's constant warfare, lots of armies that are willing to employ unemployed fighting men. During the Tokugawa period, when there's no warfare and there are no wars and, and uh, uh, armies are uh, circumscribed and, and defined by centralized authority, uh, there's less outlet for people who lose their jobs, and, and so it becomes a bigger sort of problem. One of Naganori's former samurai, Oishi Kuranosuke, called his comrades together and asked if they would help him take revenge. Forty-six of them agreed. Rather than immediately attacking the man who they identified as responsible for their, their master's downfall, the guy that he'd attacked, figuring that he would be expecting it and be prepared to defend himself up front, they basically laid low for three years and pretended to go along with shogun orders and accept their fate. The 47 ronin dispersed and for the next three years found other occupations as craftsmen and laborers. Oishi himself pretended to become a drunk and a vagrant, consorting with prostitutes and undesirables. Eventually, just as the ronin had hoped, their target relaxed his guard, thinking he was out of danger. Then the ronin finally made their move. They met according to prearranged plan, assembled themselves and, and staged a night attack on the guy's house, found him cowering in a closet, dragged him out, killed him, decapitated him, and then delivered the, uh, uh, the head to the grave of their master, and then presented themselves to the authorities to be arrested for participating in a, an illegal vendetta. All 47 masterless samurai were ordered to commit seppuku, which they did. The episode stunned quiet, peacetime Japan. But at the same time, it filled many citizens with pride to know that the noble samurai principles of devout loyalty and self-sacrifice had not been extinguished. Today in Ako, Japan, the former home of the daimyo Asano Naganori, a shrine stands in honor of the loyal and selfless 47 Ronin. The warrior code by which they lived and that drove their bold action would continue to shape the Japanese national identity and inspire acts of eager self-sacrifice for centuries to come. On July 8, 1853, four U.S. warships commanded by Commodore Matthew C. Perry sailed into the mouth of Edo Bay. They had come to pry open Japan's borders, whether the Japanese government liked it or not. The U.S. was interested in trade, of course, but their most pressing interest in Japan was as a port for U.S. whaling ships in the far Pacific to resupply and make repairs. Whaling was big business in 1853, since whale oil was the chief source of fuel for household lanterns. In the past, other U.S. dignitaries arriving in Japan in lone vessels had tried forcing their way into the country, but they had been sent packing. When Perry came in, he was more effective than the earlier people because he had a, a formidable um, fleet, and he stationed it right off of Edo, which is the largest city, and disrupted the supply of foods to the capital. The Japanese were strong coastal sailors, but they had no powerful navy to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Perry's heavily armed ships. Plus, the Americans were light years ahead of the Japanese in firearms technology. The U.S. had rifled cannons and musketry that could penetrate samurai armor and crumble the strongest daimyo castle. The only real gun technology the samurai had was that of the rudimentary matchlock musket 
brought to the islands from Portugal 310 years earlier. Two and a half centuries of peace had eliminated the need for improved firearms. Perry couldn't simply be brushed off, so the Tokugawa government agreed to let him in. What they did, though, they opened up a consulate in an incredibly remote port. It was still very isolated, so it still took a number of years for things to change. So the Tokugawa really tried to limit his actions. Over time, the U.S. succeeded in pressuring the Shogun into signing treaties that allowed more access. The first treaty was not a treaty for commercial purposes. It was just a treaty of goodwill, so to speak. The, the second treaty, which came a few years later, was for trade, where, where the barbarians could come into Japan, set up trading posts, and actually have free reign of certain areas in Japan. And the samurai didn't like that. Japan's leaders hadn't given up the fight. They were simply biding their time. They began studying Western military tactics and acquiring modern weaponry as fast as they could. They planned to give the foreigners the boot as soon as possible. But by the mid-1860s, many daimyo and their samurai had grown impatient. They began clamoring for a change in leadership. Basically, they were afraid that Japan was going to be another China. Remember, Great Britain had subjugated parts of China, Hong Kong, and India. And France and Russia and Great Britain were kind of like waiting on the sidelines like wolves with their fangs dripping. So some of the samurai perceived it. In the view of many young radical warriors, if the shogun wouldn't act to protect Japan, the only answer seemed to be to overthrow the shogun or government, which had gradually weakened, and restore the emperor to a position of supreme political power. In 1866, it happened, and with surprisingly little bloodshed. That year, the aging shogun Tokugawa Iemochi died, and a new family member, Tokugawa Kieki, took charge. But Kieki's reign was over before it started. Aware that much of the warrior class did not support him, he accepted his political fate. In November 1867, fearing an all-out civil war, shogun Tokugawa Kieki relinquished power to the young emperor Meiji. Nearly 700 years of warrior government in Japan had come to an inglorious close. But far from improving the lot of the frustrated samurai class, this historic power shift compounded their problems. The emperor's bureaucrats introduced reforms that stripped power from regional daimyo and their samurai and centralized that power in the capital. Tokyo increasingly is saying, we will show central authority by first replacing daimyo with governors and then replacing those governors with men from other parts of Japan to show that it's Tokyo's authority that holds sway even in the countryside. The final humiliation came with a law completely banning the wearing of swords, the most visible symbol of the samurai. By 1877, samurai in Japan's conservative southwest province of Satsuma had had enough. 9,000 warriors rose in rebellion, led by a talented war chief named Saigo Takamori. Ironically, Saigo had helped overthrow the shogun 10 years earlier. The rebels carried a mixture of modern rifles and traditional weapons, but the arms weren't sufficient to stand up to the hordes of government troops sent to crush the uprising. After weeks of fighting and an ill-fated siege of a government stronghold, the surviving rebels fell back to Satsuma for a last stand near Saigo's home in Kakoshima. On the cool morning of September 24th, Saigo and 300 of his die-hard followers marched out, armed only with swords, to meet the enemy. They want the symbolism of the swords. They're also out of gunpowder. And they've spent the evening before writing poems about it. They've spent the evening before celebrating their deaths. And it's all but choreographed. They march out into a hail of gunfire. They're surrounded by cannon. They're surrounded by tens of thousands of Japanese Imperial troops. And they fully know they're going to die. The majority of the rebel samurai met their deaths within minutes. Saigo himself was wounded by gunfire, and a few faithful servants carried him to a nearby hillside, where they helped him end his life in the traditional samurai manner. He didn't actually commit seppuku because he was shot through the hip 
and fell. He was probably unable to sit. He may have gone into shock immediately. He was certainly unable to sit up and pull a sword and slit his abdomen. But his men took his head anyway, and they hit it. They hit it as though this were 1220. You would not want the enemy army to get that head and have a trophy. The crushing of the Satsuma Rebellion marked the end of violent resistance to the modernizing reforms of the Meiji government. After 1877, no one thinks that force of arms are going to preserve the samurai way of life anymore, and everyone recognizes that you basically have to take this new Meiji state on its own terms. But while the age of the warrior may have passed, deep sentiment for the samurai heritage still lingered in the hearts of many Japanese citizens. In 1898, a scant two decades following the rebellion in Satsuma, private citizens erected a statue of Saigo Takamori in a park in Tokyo. At the behest of nervous government officials, the likeness reflects the more peaceful side of the warrior chieftain, still remembered as the last true samurai. After 167 years of distortion, in the closing decades of the 19th century, the new Meiji imperial government in Japan scrambled to industrialize and build a formidable modern war machine. The growth of the country's naval and military sciences had been stunted by two and a half centuries of self-imposed isolation, and Japan's leaders were determined to catch up with Western nations. The knowledge was there when Japan was supposedly closed. Enough people knew what to borrow, what to get, what they needed to make Japan much stronger. And I think the speed at which they were able to do that is just really remarkable. By the early 20th century, Japan was a force to be reckoned with. While the samurai no longer existed as a recognized social class, the compulsory public education system inculcated many of their beliefs and customs, especially the warrior code, into young students. The schools also resurrected the notions of the emperor's divinity and the superiority of the Japanese race. These ideas eventually helped fuel Japan's naked aggression during World War II, a conflict in which the legacy of the samurai blatantly reared its head. The Japanese Imperial Army seized on the samurai, not surprisingly, as a, a major symbol for forging a kind of code or a culture for its officers and men. However, such exploitation of the warrior code flew in the face of its original intent. The modern Japanese military was made up largely of farmer and merchant stock, and the warrior code had traditionally been a means of defining how samurai were different from these classes of society. The Imperial Army turned that around and said, no, these are warrior values, that means they're Japanese values, and we're all samurai at heart. During the fighting in the Pacific, the warrior code's emphasis on self-sacrifice revealed itself in the Japanese soldiers' seeming lack of regard for their own lives. Believing it was better to die than to surrender, Imperial Army soldiers in several extended battles, including Guadalcanal and Iwo Jima, engaged in suicidal charges when it became obvious that a fight was lost. Other symbols of samurai influence also emerged. For instance, the wearing of traditional swords by Japanese officers in combat became customary. You even have pilots carrying samurai swords with them in the cockpits of their planes. And then there were the kamikaze, pilots who embarked on suicide missions, crashing their planes into Allied ships at sea. By taking the name kamikaze, the divine wind that destroyed the attacking Mongol armada in the 13th century, the modern-day pilots linked themselves to a glorious past 
there was definitely a consciousness which one can perceive from the poetry they wrote as their fa farewell poems and other things that they were, for better or for worse, managing to recreate or reconnect themselves with, some, with something from their past which they felt was real. Following the Japanese defeat in 1945, however, open displays of pride in the samurai past and the way of the warrior submerged for a number of years. But by the 1970s, signs of them surfaced once again. In an extreme case, renowned Japanese author Yukio Mishima, known for his fervent nationalism and resentment of the U.S. authored Japanese constitution, staged a mini-insurrection at the headquarters of the Japanese Self-Defense Forces. Mishima had spent his life glorifying the samurai past and had been heavily influenced by works of warrior philosophy, such as the classic Hagakure. He had also become obsessed with the idea of committing seppuku, or harakiri. On November 25, 1970, the famous author, along with a group of followers, entered the self-defense forces compound on false pretenses. Mishima then ordered his men to seize and restrain the commandant. He said, please assemble the 900 fellows uh, on the base here. I need to talk to them. And he stepped out on the balcony and delivered himself a beautifully written manifesto while helicopters and the press swirled around him overhead. Mishima asked the gathered soldiers to rise up with him in the name of the emperor and help him restore Japan to its former military glory. He knew full well, in my opinion, that that would never happen. But he wanted, in my view, uh, the death which this allowed him to die. When the soldiers booed him, Mishima cut his speech short and withdrew back into the headquarters. Then, with help from two of his closest aides, he carried out the ancient method of warrior suicide he had romanticized since childhood. In front of the horrified commandant, he opened his belly and was then beheaded by his second in command, a young man who is now also venerated by the Japanese right, who then also committed harakiri himself and was beheaded by a third of these fellows. The incident stunned the Japanese people who by now had fully recovered from the war and were enjoying a measure of Western-style economic prosperity. But in the hearts of many Japanese, the radical action also evoked a strange sadness. Many people, although it was dangerous to do so, were moved by this in ways that they were careful about expressing following it. Although there was, to be sure, personal idiosyncratic pathology involved in Mishima's end, there was at the same time uh, an embodiment of the kind of despair that many Japanese were feeling about making so much money and feeling so empty and about feeling culturally disinherited, disconnection from uh, the traditions that, mythological or not, were at the center of Japan's view of itself into the past. Through the 1980s and early 90s, Japan continued to prosper. But even in an age of conference calls and cubicles, some Japanese businessmen looked once again to ancient samurai wisdom for help in their corporate battles. The Book of Five Rings, written in 1643 by legendary swordsman Miyamoto Musashi, discusses Zen-inspired fighting techniques and battle tactics. The work became popular among corporate warriors in both Japan and the United States, who were hoping to gain an advantage in the boardroom. Today, the samurai legacy persists most obviously in the form of martial arts academies. Many of these schools still require their students to study the warrior code and to strive to behave according to the virtues it promotes. Glimpses of the samurai past can also be seen at heritage festivals hosted by many Japanese municipalities. These festivals feature living historians decked out in full samurai battle armor, parading through the streets on horseback. Finally, the samurai has also become a staple of popular culture. Samurai themes continue to hold fascination for filmmakers and video game creators. Even though the samurai as a class no longer exists, interest in them, interest in the martial arts, uh, even if you look at Star Wars with the lightsabers, you know, I mean, it's something which I almost think is still alive. And it's not confined to Japan. <laughs> 
The ancient ways of the sword and bow may have been harsh, but in the view of many, their accompanying virtues of loyalty, self-discipline, and self-sacrifice are as valuable today as they were 1,000 years ago, at the origin of a noble warrior tradition, the tradition of the samurai. A century.